Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Lenor Cadena. I have a broken foot, but I'm walking weird. <laughs> I'm a professor in the anthropology department here. Um, I'm also a faculty fellow for our diversity, equity, and inclusion office. Um, I'm very excited to see you and to be here today. I'm very excited to have Dr. Gonzalez here giving us a talk. I'm going to introduce Dr. Gonzalez. She is a graduate from UC Santa Barbara. Her degree is in Chicano and Chicano studies. Her emphasis was on feminist studies, but also she was a transfer student, so she was a community college student as well in transfer. Um, maybe I want to, I mean, I was just talking to her. It's so hard to kind of have a list. With, I would be here for a long time if I listed all the stuff she's been involved in. Um, she's definitely involved in ethnic studies related uh, events. They have an ethnic studies summit coming up next week, which she probably will give you more information about. She's had the Social Justice Summit twice. Um, I think we were involved in the Anarchist Book Fair as well. Um, she just got back with a group of students um, going to an LGBTQ uh, conference in Detroit. A very, um, she takes students along with um, other people in her department to various conferences, which I think is really, really important to expose our students in a, a nationwide context to uh, the different conferences that are out there. So. Um, well, let's go ahead and welcome Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Leonard. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that um, y'all are here. So the title of the, work, I'm going to say workshop because it's going to be pretty hands-on. We're going to be doing some activities, some discussion, lecture. It's usually how I run my classes, pretty interactive. I don't like to do any one thing for too long. Um, so the title of the workshop today is Creating Safer uh, and Inclusive Spaces for LGBTQ plus Students. Um, and there's already a couple of concepts in the title that you might be curious about. So I'm going to talk about what's a safe space, safer spaces. Um, there's lots of terminology related to LGBTQ issues. I mean, even LGBTQ plus is another concept I'm going to be talking about. Um, and so there's a lot of terminology um, within the field, within the community. Um, identities and expressions are changing. What seems like every day I can't keep up with like new terminology, right? Um, and so we're going to keep it pretty foundational and basic today um, and just get at some of the core ideas and the core concepts. We're going to be talking about different identity expressions. Um, and then if you want more information or to go more in depth, there'll be opportunities to ask questions and then maybe like a follow-up workshop or um, other ways that we can sort of go into more depth. But this is more of like an overview, sort of a LGBTQ issues 101, OK? Okay, so to start, I want to begin with uh, land acknowledgement. Um, and so just a little bit about myself. Um, I think it's important to also position ourselves, especially as um, faculty and staff, to model for students, um, you know, to be brave in, in bringing our whole selves into the classroom or into a meeting or into whatever space it is. Um, and so I identify um, as Chicana and Apache, or I combine those terms, and um, Apachicana is a term I made up for myself. <laughs> and so my family is from uh, New Mexico. Um, I identify as Two-Spirit, a uh, queer woman of color, um, and so it's really important for me to think about um, always where I am um, and who are the original stewards of the land, wherever it is, whether I'm on campus or at home. Um, or if I'm traveling. And so it's really important that we acknowledge the folks um, who are still currently here um, and who are the original um, stewards of the land. And so um, I just want to welcome everybody to the place that was originally known as Hotunga. So this is uh, Tongva Village. Um, the center of this area was closer to Placentia, Yorba Linda area. Um, but the uh, Tongva, also known as the Kich Gabrileño, Folks are really a huge group um, over LA, Orange County, Long Beach, so really large group. Um, the area is also home to the Luiseño and the Ahashiman nations. Um, you might be more familiar with the terms that the Spanish imposed on them during the mission era, so the Luiseño, Gabrileño, and Juanaño mission, band of mission Indians. Okay, so I want to start uh, with getting grounded. 
Um, it's Friday at 8.30, so I really appreciate you all taking your Friday to come be here. Um, and I know we probably have a lot going on in our minds, things that we carry with us, stressors. It's like already towards the end of the semester. Uh, we just got back from spring break, and it seems like people are more drained and more stressed after spring break instead of being rejuvenated and refreshed. Um, so I just want us to sort of get grounded together because it's really important that we are fully present as much as possible. You know, there's a lot of things that we carry with us, things that we're thinking about in our lives, personal issues, family, things like that. But to try to get as grounded and as present as possible to be able to really dive into the material, to re really be able to connect with each other and have open, honest dialogue. Um, and so... What I do, this is an activity that I do in class, um, is to just get grounded together. And so I like starting with a definition of grounded. Um, and so the general Merriam-Webster dictionary definition is well-balanced and sensible, mentally and emotionally balanced, which is nice. For me, seems more like a goal than like an actual state of being. I'm always trying to maintain a balance, right? Uh, but the definition that I really like and think pertains to this activity is to try to be present in your body and connected with the earth, allowing you to feel centered and balanced no matter what's going on around you. And this is really difficult because there's always a lot going on around us, right? Um, and so if we were in a different setup, I'd probably dim the lights and we'd sit in a circle. And So I think, yeah, do you want to... Work, should, can we work the lights? Is, are they here? Or is that okay? I just want to uh, mention something I forgot. Um, is that uh, this is being recorded. If anybody has any uh, questions or concerns, please let me know. The reason for recording is because we're going to have a live stream of the event. So thank you. 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 Thank um, okay, so what I would like everybody to do is you can just um, kind of feel how you're sitting in your seat. Um, if you have a pen or a pencil in your hand, you can just sort of put it down and find a comfortable way that you're sitting. I'm, I'm going to sit with, with y'all. Um, so just find a comfortable seated position and you can um, just kind of feel how you're sitting. Oftentimes when we sit down, we don't feel our bodies. We just sort of go into autopilot. Um, so just kind of feel... Um, how your spine is, um, feel where your hands are comfortable, so they can either be on your lap, on the table, um, near your side. Um, and then if you're comfortable, you can close your eyes. We're going to breathe together. Um, if you don't want to close your eyes, you're not comfortable, you can just look uh, in front of you and kind of soften your stare, um, soften your gaze. Um, and let's just take a couple of breaths in, deep breaths in together. So let's breathe in. And breathe out. Okay, and breathe in. And breathe out. And just continue breathing. How it's comfortable for you. Taking some deep inhales. And long exhales. And then just kind of notice if you feel stress in your body. So I carry a lot of stress in my jaw. I clench my jaw when I'm stressed out. So maybe just relax your jaw. If you want to shake your neck out, maybe roll your shoulders. Feel your feet planted on the floor while you're still breathing. And if this feels uncomfortable for you, just pay attention to where the discomfort is coming from you're not used to focusing on yourself without a million things going on in your mind or if you're distracted just kind of notice the distractions um, and then let them leave as you breathe in and breathe out Kim okay, let's take two more breaths together in and out okay one more breath in and out. Okay, if you had your eyes closed, you can start to open or soften your gaze. I'm going to turn the lights back on. I can figure them out. Okay. Awesome. Thank you all for being open to doing that. Hopefully it's not too early that it actually put you to sleep. <laughs>
Okay, good. Uh, and I like this quote, um, live that life, the one that gives you breath and takes your breath away. I think breath is really important, especially when we're, and I have to remind myself to breathe all the time, just given the nature of the content of what I teach and what we talk about in class. So I teach ethnic studies, women's studies. Uh, we talk a lot about institutional oppression um, and violence and really heavy things. We also talk about, you know, the beautiful aspects and the, the wonderful parts of our communities. Um, but it's really important to sort of breathe, remember to breathe, um, despite everything that's going on around you. Okay, um, so I just want to start by defining safe space. Um, you have probably seen like the safe, I don't think I have any, um, but like the safe space banners or stickers right on some doors. Um, but I want to talk about safer spaces um, just because a space can never be completely safe for everyone who's in the room. Um, so the definition that we're going to use today, and we can amend this depending on your thoughts about it, um, how you've experienced it, your uh, feedback, because these are always working definitions, both that I extrapolate from uh, different texts or authors, but also just from like in practice working with students and other folks. So this is a definition that I'm working with right now. Um, so safer space is a physical place or environment where marginalized people are guarded from hostility, harassment, and discrimination they may face outside the space. Um, so it's not necessarily 100% totally free of those things, but it's an ongoing process of working on attempting to create a space that is free from those things. Um, an idea of a safer space and a goal is really to reduce and respond to harm. A lot of times um, what I witness or what I have experienced myself um, is people see harm being done on different levels, right? It could be a comment. And I, I really don't talk about microaggressions because I think these are like verbal forms of violence. Um, and so we might see some sort of um, what's known popularly as a microaggression or somebody says something maybe homophobic or racist or, um, but we clam up and don't say anything, right? Um, which is especially detrimental in the classroom. So the idea is to reduce harm when possible and then to respond to it actively. Um, another goal of creating a safer space is to create affirming and supportive environments, especially for students, communities. And this really applies to everybody, to faculty and staff as well, because I want to walk into a space and feel this too, right? Um, but to create affirming and supportive environments, particularly for marginalized communities. Um, and this is essential, okay, so I'm going to throw out some concepts already. I'm going to define these, so don't worry, okay? So this is essential for trans and gender non-conforming, so TGNC, trans and gender non-conforming and queer folks. Um, and I'm also using queer as an umbrella term for the LGBTQIA+, and I'll talk about that too. Um, so this is essential for TGNC and queer folks who have historically and continue to be dehumanized, excluded, and face violence in families, in organizations, in institutions. So we have to actively work to reduce and respond to harm. We have to actively work to create affirming and supportive environments. It's not enough to say, I'm an ally, or I support LGBTQ students, or, you know, I voted against Prop 8, or whatever it was, right? We have to actively work against um, harm. Any questions on this? Okay. Okay, so I wanted to start uh, sort of getting into the content first by positing some community agreements. So one of the ways that I like to run workshops, especially if it's like something that I want folks to walk away with something tangible of what they can do, um, this is one of the things that I do in all of my classes is to create community agreements. Um, and this is something that no matter what you teach, what your subject is, is something that you can do. Um, and this is a work in progress. I've been working on this for like 10 years and I change things all the time. Um, I, was, I just added something new yesterday. Um, but com So community agreements are guiding principles or a way that folks 
adhere to or uphold um, and work on when you're in a space um, where there are diverse students, diverse people, um, people who bring different marginalized identities, we have to think about how can we honor those and create spaces that are safer for folks to be able to share. This is mostly for um, discussion. Um, so I think it's important we do that here, and then this is something you can take with you. And I can send you all um, a PDF of the community agreements if this is something that you would like. Okay. Um, so number one, you're invited to show up as your whole self. So I know the focus here is LGBTQ issues, um, but, but we're more than just that, right? So we have an ethnic and cultural identity. We have gender identities. We have immigrant status and language and um, ability and like all these things. Um, and so you're invited to show up as your whole self and to speak from that perspective because there's nuances when we start to think about, okay, how, how do... LGBTQ students face particular issues when they're also students of color or where they're also a student with a disability or where, right, where we start to add some layers. Um, this one's really important. This is one that I just added because I listened to um, a podcast and one of the, one of the podcasters talks about um, consenting to learn in public together. Um, so this is new for, I know, a lot of folks and maybe kind of feels uncomfortable and you're not sure and you don't want to say the wrong thing or offend somebody. Um, but I think if we come with the understanding that we're all learning together, I mean, including me, I'm like facilitating the workshop, but I'm still learning. I'm still growing. There's still, you know, nobody's perfect. I'm still trying to figure things out myself. Um, and so just sort of like we're going to hold each other accountable in the space, but also be aware that it's a learning process and people don't necessarily um, have the language yet or know how to sort of articulate their ideas, right? Um, and use inclusive language. And I'm going to model this for you all. Um, I'm going to talk about it in particular when we talk about gender pronouns and naming and things like that. Um, and I have a little segment on um, gendered language because the language that we use is so gendered, but we've been so conditioned to use it that we don't often see it um, unless you're being marginalized by it and then you feel it, right? Um, so, for example, um, I say y'all, right, instead of you guys. Um, so using um, more inclusive language, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and deep listening is important, so um, I'm going to turn the floor over to y'all in just a little bit, and we're going to listen to each other's stories and comments and things like that, and so it's important that we, as best as possible, um, really deeply listen to each other, and so this means sort of noticing what the person is saying and maybe before jumping in, um, kind of taking in the message and, and you know, being intentional um, with what you're going to say before um, you speak. I think I have a, yeah, so use thoughtful and intentional speech. Um, to speak with integrity, both about yourself and about others, we, and I hear this a lot, and I, I'm guilty of it as well sometimes, I try not to, um, but we self-deprecate a lot, or we self-criticize, or we put ourselves down, or this is a dumb question, but, right? Um, and so working to like speak with integrity towards yourself and towards others um, and just being thoughtful um, and intentional. But again, we're learning together, right? Um, using I statements, especially when you're speaking about a particular story or experience, um, it's important because I, I don't discount uh, anecdotal evidence. I think our stories are important. Um, but also, we can't speak for our entire group, right? So I'm not going to come up here and say, well, you know, Chicanas do this, right? Well, maybe, but probably not all of us, right? <laughs> okay. Um, and, I, and I think this one is really important, too. It's uh, sort of an organizer speak. It's step up, step back, or also known as take space, give space. So just think about understanding um, your positionality and your identity. So maybe making space for students to speak, um, maybe giving space for queer students of color to speak, um, or thinking about if you're sharing a lot, because um, some students are really about the material, or some faculty are, I have so much to say. And this is something for me, because I love to talk. I mean, I went, I was like, let me find a career where I can get paid to talk. 
Um, so I have to like, you know, hold myself back a little bit and like share, share the space. So just kind of notice how much you're sharing and if you're, if you're giving space for, for other folks. Um, this one's really important, so take the lesson, not the name. So we're going to probably learn a lot in here today. People are going to share personal stories, um, and it's important that if there was a lesson there, we take those lessons with us, but like, don't go out and say, oh, did you know that so this happened to so-and-so? And, um, so, so leave the name, and, and really what that means is um, respect confidentiality, right? Um, especially if somebody says, this needs to stay here with what I'm about to share, right? Um, and give content warnings. Um, and so I don't really have anything I think um, that to me is immediately like triggering or gonna like spark something um, emotional or cause undue harm. If I do, um, I'll, I'll let you all know. But this is especially like if we're sharing a personal story, say about um, violence or about um, getting kicked out of your house or about something like heavy like we don't know how it's going to affect other people so maybe just give a, a just a content warning so people know this is tricky though because you never know what's going to trigger something in you like I'll be watching a commercial and just like break into tears and I'm like what did that bring up for me right I, like and so I have to think about like where is that coming from so we don't always know what's going to cause like an emotional response in us but when possible just give content warnings um, and then finally, and I think most importantly, taking care of yourself. And this also has to do with trying to be aware of your own personal boundaries. So think about what you feel comfortable sharing. If there's something that you don't feel comfortable with, um, please let me know or let you know somebody around you know. And it's, it takes time, right, to kind of figure out what your personal boundaries are, um, both uh, emotionally and physically. Um, so just if there's something that comes up for you and you need to step out, get some water or some air or anything like that, like, please feel free. Okay. Questions on these? Okay. And usually I give these to students. We talk about them. We break them apart. We talk about, like, what this would actually look like. Um, and I've updated this and added based on discussions I've had with students and things that they've recommended. And so this is um, an ongoing changing list. Okay. Perfect. So I want to start, I gave you all some stickies, so if you want to get those out. Um, what I learned doing this workshop is that folks have sticky questions, um, and they want to know about sticky situations, um, and I think one way to address the questions and to start to think about the situations or the scenarios is to first write them down. So if you have a particular question or questions, if you can write them down on the sticky notes, and these are anonymous, they're all the same. I'm going to have you all pass them up so you can put your name on them or not. Um, and then on a, if you have another sticky that you want to write, like a situation, maybe there was something that you witnessed or that you experienced, and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know how to handle that. How should I have handled that? Um, or maybe in hindsight you thought, wow, I wonder what were the other options, if, if I could have handled that better. Or maybe there's a situation or a scenario that you want to put forth to the, put forth to the group so we can talk about. We're gonna, I'm going to gather these. I'm going to try to answer some of the questions throughout to see if there's anything that I'm going to cover. And then for the situations, we're actually going to have some scenarios that we're going to talk about because we can kind of theorize about it all day, but if we're not actually like practicing like how to talk about these issues and it's a little bit harder and harder to grasp um, so go ahead and take a couple of minutes and just write down if you have any it doesn't matter what it is any question um, big or small um, write down a question that you have about the topic and or if there's a scenario that you've experienced or that you've witnessed could be something ongoing it could be something that's happened in the past or just something that you want to know how to address it could be something that has not happened but that you think you know the likelihood of it might happen and so you want to um, get some feedback on that okay so i'll give you all um, a couple minutes to think about that okay so we have about six what i would classify as scenarios um, so I'm going to save those for that section. Um, one that has stumped me, which I'm excited about, um, 
stem fem? I don't know what that means. So I'm going to look that up. A stem Did, is someone who's in science. In other words, stem is that what like science technology is uh-huh. a, a woman who's in a traditionally men's, you know, engineering. Ah. Uh-huh. Okay, I will look that up on our more formal break to see what I can find. Okay, and then I think some of these I can, I will cover during the presentation. Um, So I'll read them so you know to look for them. Um, So one is how the term queer tends to put people off. Yes, it does. Um... (laughs) And, and this is a term that I use, that I identify with, and I'm going to define it for y'all in just a little bit. Um, but for me, it's a politicized term that I think over time it's been sort of losing its traction and its teeth um, with the mainstreaming of LGBTQ issues. Um, and, okay, I don't want to use give you too many concepts. But, yes, it does tend to put... Um, people off Um, and I think there's an interesting thing that's happening with folks like in an older generation who tend not to use it but then also younger folks who maybe don't have the context that of how that term came about as a like a radical political identity for really trans and queer liberation so I will talk about that um a question, why do I distinguish TGNC, so transgender nonconforming, from queer? Um, is it because TGNC often get overlooked in queer conversations, or is it because I view them as distinct? Um, and I'm going to answer this question because I'm going to um, break up some of the key concepts, which are um, sex, gender, and sexuality. And these are actually distinct and different. People often conflate them as meaning the same thing. Um, And so trans and gender nonconforming are gender identities, and queer can also be a gender identity depending on what we're talking about, like gender queer. Um, But most of the times it's used to talk about um, sexual orientation or sexuality. So that's why the distinction, but I'll go over that in a little bit more detail. Um, And then another question about pronouns in emails. Um, And then the other part I'm going to hold off on. But yes, we're going to have a whole section on um, pronouns, um, which is important. So I'll I'll address that question as well. And then the rest are scenarios. So I'm going to table those for just a little bit, but we'll get to all of the scenarios. They're great. Okay, so I just wanted to give you um, a few numbers because I think these are important. So there's uh, been a couple of recent really big studies that have been put out. Um, And I'm glad that you all are here. And I think there's some sort of draw or connection in either identifying with the community, but I think everybody, right, having a desire to want to be an advocate and an ally to folks because you can be part of a community and not be an advocate for it, right? Um, so I think it's important. Um, some people work in really concrete numbers. I tend to work more with like personal stories and things that I see. Uh, but some folks are numbers folks and want to know want to know about the situation um, numerically. So just some numbers around LGBTQ issues and why this is important to create safer and inclusive spaces for our students um, and faculty and staff. Um, So young adults age 18 to 36 are by far the most likely to identify as LGBT and all of the other different identifying markers that are sort of within those, um, that umbrella term. Um, And so more and more young people um, are identifying as LGBTQ. I just read maybe a couple of weeks ago, this number was like really shocking to me, but in a, um, a, na- a nationwide survey, over 40% of Latinx youth identified as non-binary um, or gender non-conforming. Um, and so more and more, I think because students are having exposure to the opportunities that are available to them, it's not to say that like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, five generations ago, folks weren't identifying or, or Um, a part of this community. It's just the language is changing and the climate is changing and folks have a different language and understanding of their identity to be able to identify with the community, right? Sorry, it's a little hard to see. I don't know why it came out this way. 
So 25% of California adolescents identify as gender non-conforming. So that's a, over, over a quarter um, of youth in California in particular. The nationwide number is smaller. Um, but I think it's interesting because if we think about what's going on nationwide and in other states that are maybe not um, as LGBTQ friendly, it doesn't mean that the students aren't there, but maybe they just don't feel comfortable identifying in that way because of the policies and the practices in their home state. Um, LGBTQ youth are two times as likely as their non-LGBTQ peers to be physically assaulted at school. This is from the Human Rights Campaign. So higher incidences of um, violence. Um, and I tend not to like the word bullying either. Um, this is a whole other conversation, but um, they face uh, physical um, and emotional violence. Sorry, this is, I'm, so I'm just going to read these because they're really hard to see. Um, so bisexual people make up the largest share of LG, the LGBTQ community, which I think is surprising for some. I was actually surprised by this statistic um, as somebody who identifies with this uh, community, not so much the label, um, but that people make up the largest share of the LGBTQ community. Bisexual youth are much less likely than lesbian and gay youth to be out at school. Um, and they face higher rates of exclusion, harassment, and violence, both at school, in the workplace, and in different organizations and institutions. Um, so 35% of trans students attending college, graduate school, professional, or technical school reported high rates of negative treatment by students, teachers, and staff, including harassment and bullying. Trans students often experience avoidance or antagonism from faculty and other students, leading them to feel anxious, uncomfortable, and possibly threatened. Um, LGBTQ youth face much higher risks of homelessness and economic vulnerability, um, higher incidences of being in the foster system, higher rates of police harassment and incarceration, um, especially when we're talking about LGBTQ youth of color. Um, and then 92% of LGBTQ youth say they hear negative messages about being LGBTQ, um, and the top sources are school, their peers, um, and the internet. Any questions or comments on these stats? I mean, it's probably, like, you might not have known the exact numbers, um, but I think it's something that is probably not super shocking, right? Okay. Um, and so it's really important. So when we're thinking about the numbers, right, these are actually experienced, embodied experiences in the lives of our students, but also faculty and staff on campus. Um, and it's really important to think about how folks move through the world using an intersectional approach. Um, so what this means is LGBTQ youth of color often experience additional stress and adverse effects to their health and well-being as a result of bias related to their multiple intersecting identities. So, for example, they might face homophobia, biphobia, or transphobia. Um, but LGBTQ students of color often encounter racial discrimination um, and or xenophobia that can further complicate their ability to thrive in school and beyond. Um, educators must acknowledge that LGBTQ youth of color are more likely to experience police brutality, homelessness, and the school-to-prison pipeline. So while we're talking about LGBTQ issues, it's also important to think about, as I had said earlier, like how do, what's the added layer, right, that, that students of color face, or maybe undocumented students, right? There's um, a concept, undocu-queer, so if students are undocumented and LGBTQ, what's the added stressors or things that they face. Some things to think about. Okay, so this is the lens that we're gonna use um, going forward. Um, and this is a super simplified description of what queer theory is. Um, but what it provides is a lens to understand LGBTQ issues, but also um, it's a lens to understand institutions and society and what queer theory does and what it provides us um, is it destabilizes the assumed naturalness of the social order. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the gender binary and what that is and how we've been really conditioned to see that as natural. Um, and 
queer theorists do a lot of great work to destabilize the assumed naturalness of, of that, of the gender binary, but also of just of the social order. Um, it moves beyond binary categories and focuses on the instability of those categories. This is why it gets tricky too for folks is because the categories are always shifting. They function within um, dynamics of power. Um, so for example, some questions that queer theory poses is how are the categories created? For what purpose are these categories created? How are they sustained? How are they undone? People understand themselves in relationship to one another. So you have a dominant group um, and then the group who is marginalized or other, but it, it questions even those, categori those categories, how they're created. And one of the things I think is one of the most important contributions of queer theory is that it uncouples gender from biological sex. Folks see sex and biological sex and gender as synonymous and they talk about it in a synonymous way or when we're talking about issues of gender folks always want to bring the discussion back to the body and the physical body um, and they what so that's a nice way of saying they always want to talk about um, genitalia um, but queer theory is really asking us to see beyond that um, and so I'm going to talk about that in, in a little bit more in more detail so it's Okay, so I'm going to hold off. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Um, and again, it also emphasizes multiple identities and multiplicity, so the idea of using an intersectional approach to understand these issues, right? How students experience or faculty and staff experience these issues. Okay. Um, and so these are some things I'm going to go over with actual examples. Okay. This is just the framework or the lens that we're going to be using. Any questions on that? Okay. Can I ask real quick? What yeah. Do you mean by multiplicity. So just multiple identities, like intersectional identities. Yeah. Okay. So the gender binary. Um, I like visuals, and so so this to me is like a really simple way to think about the gender binary. Um, and how it's been constructed in Western cultures, um, the U.S. included. So the U.S. adheres to a really rigid gender binary, and we've all been conditioned to think about and see the world in this way, um, regardless of how we understand our identity. Uh, but the gender binary is its pretty simple when you break it down, um, and I'm going to talk about what each of these categories are. Um, but when we think about the gender binary, um, it's on one side, <laughs> excuse me, male, man, masculine, um, who should be attracted to a female, woman, feminine, right, attracted to the other side of the binary. And folks have been conditioned, we've all been conditioned in society to think that these are supposed to align. So a woman is supposed to be feminine and attracted to a masculine man. Right. Um, if we think about um, men, the the idea of um, a gender expression is supposed to be masculine, um, but these don't necessarily line up this easily. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna break I'm gonna break these categories down, but this is just to kind of visually see what the gender binary is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any questions on that? Okay. Okay. Um, so, so we're going to break down the gender binary because gender and sexuality um, and sex are different social groups. They are not the same. They don't mean the same thing. They're, they're not synonymous. And while there might be connections between them, there's connections between them the same way there's connections between my ethnic identity and my religious identity. Uh, it's, they're different, right? Um, so, and I feel like I'm really driving this point home, um, gender and sexuality intersect with other social identities and categories of power, so like race, ethnicity, religion, immigrant status, nationality, ability, class, etc. So just some takeaways. And then the third takeaway, um, there's small changes we can implement immediately to make our respective campuses safer for trans, gender nonconforming, non-binary and queer students, faculty and staff. Um, so let's now get into talking about how. 
Okay, so first I want to talk about this concept. So there's three concepts that I'm going to focus on. Just as some foundational basics, and then we're going to get into like some scenarios and case studies and discussion. Um, so the first concept is birth sex or biological sex. And the definition of this is just a specific set of genetic, chemical, and anatomical characteristics that we're born with, or maybe that develop over time as we mature. Um, and, and in the U.S., more often than not, people are assigned a sex at birth based on a cursory examination of external genitalia. So people say, it's a male, this is a female. Um, and so the terminology or the identities that go with this concept or this definition, the social identity um, that we hear often are female, male, and intersex. So this is already breaking down the gender binary. There aren't only two options for um, the sex that we're assigned at birth. Um, and oftentimes, we'll hear within the LGBTQ community, within queer studies, when we talk about sex, it's the um, sex that we're assigned at birth. So we're assigned female, we're assigned male, we have no say over it. It's whatever the doctors and the parents agree to. Yes, this is a male. Yes, this is a female, right? Sort of based on a cursory visual examination. But there's so much more to our, our biology than our external genitalia, right? Um, and so one way we can think about breaking down the gender binary is by thinking about um, another option, which is intersex. Um, and so I'm going to show a short video, um, and then we're going to talk about what it's like to be intersex. What is this identity? Questions, comments, reactions? Mm -hmm. um, I took a human sexuality class uh, some time ago, mm -hmm. and one of the interesting things that we talked about was that there are people who are born with both genitalia, mm -hmm. and that's interesting because like mm -hmm. that's something most people do not talk about. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if they're part of the LGBTQ plus studies, but I think it's mm -hmm. interesting how mm -hmm. we have to respect people who are just different. Yeah, yeah and that's what the I stands for. LG, you might have seen in the long acronym LGBTQIA+, that's the I. <laughs> right, and so, so really, um, so this is, the, I think, going back to the question about queer, some people are put off by it, right? And it's, um, it is an umbrella term, but it's really a way to think about people who have been constructed as being non-normative, right? Being outside of the gender binary, being othered. Right, and so this would definitely be um, a community who would fit within that paradigm, right? And there are folks who write about um, queer theory as even talking about like single mothers on welfare can be considered a part of that community because they're non-normative in terms of like you know a heterosexual patriarchal family. It's outside of the norm, right? Um, yes, Danya. Mm -hmm. And is how is it, how haven't they built like a system where like knowing how to go about it mm -hmm. or like explain to them that you don't have to do this but this right. is like optional um, and has no one like spoke up about it or they've had some art none of that like, yeah so so remember the gender binary right so when within the so there's a long history we could have a whole workshop just on like medical interventions in the lgbtq community um but the the medical in industry is really invested in maintaining this binary that's how they've been trained right all of these things need to align and there can't be any sort of deviation from the norm um and so what we see happening is that infants um, sometimes at birth, um, often have surgeries that the parents are making decisions about because they're being advised that it needs to be corrected, right? Because it doesn't fit within this rigid norm. But there are so many different um, combinations and, um, and they could be internal, uh, 
the chromosomes and DNA, or they could be external, right? And so this is another interesting question to think about. Um, how do we, and to me, this is a form of violence, right? Um, especially like keeping folks in the dark about it and like not letting folks even know until they're like older and like trying to figure it out. Um, and so it gets, it gets tricky when you're trying to understand your identity if, if something's been sort of kept from you, right? So I was going to mention, um, I teach uh, biological anthropology, mm. which we have a whole section on genetics, and, and, and I'm very interested in this topic. So there's a really good book by Joanne uh, mm. Garden. It's called Evolution's, um, Evolution's Rainbow. It's about diversity and it's really the science of sex. And I mm. invite you guys to read it. Um, and in it, I learned, you know, you're traditionally taught that the difference between male and female is um, the Y chromosome mm -hmm. makes maleness. And in the book, she proved that it's not. Mm -hmm. That the only difference is the, the size of a gamete. A gamete is basically a sex cell, right? So a gamete, male gametes tend to be smaller. And that's the only difference, which to me, I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the other thing that I want to invite us to think about is that the field of genetics is still in diapers, right? Mm -hmm. And because of the politics of science, they have used uh, um, erroneous assumptions, mm -hmm. like the presence of um, Y chromosome as connecting it with aggression, right? If people mm -hmm. who have two Y chromosomes tend to be more, um, more likely to be criminals, which again, the science of it is very weak. There's very mm -hmm. little empirical evidence. So yeah. again, I think when I, I change my perspective when I teach about um, mm -hmm. biology, that you cannot disconnect it from the politics of mm -hmm. science, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. but I thought this book was really good. Yeah, so awesome. Rainbow. Thank you for sharing. So at the end, I have a resource slide, so I'll, end that, I'll add that to the, to the resources. Yeah, and if you all have resources, we can definitely um, add it. Yeah, Jeanette? Well, I just want to share, too, I just read a story of two parents who found out when their kid was born that their kid was intersex, and they luckily had learned about that, and they were like, we're not going to make mm -hmm. any decisions. Mm -hmm. We're going to let our kid figure out their identity. And they had to fight the doctors for mm -hmm. over a year because their doctors were pressuring them mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Those are people that know right. and understand the importance of that. Like, imagine other parents that are clueless mm -hmm. and they're like, "Oh, this will make my kid healthier." Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not only that the doctors aren't teaching them the whole story, mm -hmm. but they're like fighting against the ones who know the whole story, mm -hmm. pushing for these surgeries mm -hmm. that have lifelong devastating effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there have been states, and I think California just passed. A student shared with me because um, we were talking about this in class last semester. Um, that I think, uh, and I'll look at it um, over the break, but that California just passed a law to have like a waiting period or a window to like inform the parents. Um, but it's, there's only like maybe three states that, that have any sort of protections. So it's really a matter of folks like understanding the issue and then advocating. So like back to your question, is anything being done? Um, there are a lot of activists who are pushing back against, you know, the medical industry, against science, but there's a long history of, of repression um, in, from science and the medical, the medical field. Yeah. Um, okay, so sex is our physical bodies, right? Our biology. And it's not just within this uh, binary. Okay, so let me add another. Did I skip? Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. Uh, okay, so the next concept. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, sex, sexuality, and gender. Okay, so sexuality is a broader spectrum of activities, experiences, and expressions related to physical, emotional, or romantic attraction to others. Um, and I use sexuality and not sexual orientation because <laughs> a sexual orientation has been used by the medical industry to um, criminalize uh, LGBTQ communities. Um, and it was really a transition from religious understandings of sexuality to scientific understandings of sexuality without going too much into the history um, but in the 18th and 19th century, really a way to understand and categorize folks as deviant, socially deviant. Um, folks were institutionalized, like in asylums for um, their sexual orientation. And so I tend not to use sexual orientation, but I use sexuality um, as a way to sort of demedicalize this concept and to also understand 
um, that everyone has a sexuality, not just LGBTQ folks, like straight people have a sexuality too, right? Um, and so some identities and orientations related to sexuality, and this is a super short list, there are like way more that exist, um, but queer, lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, polyamorous, um, all gender loving, I love that one, um, asexual, uh, questioning, so there's all sorts of identities, and these are not stagnant. They change, they can change over time. It's about how people understand themselves, how they see each other, how they see themselves. Um, and, you know, we might identify one way when we're younger or we gain some more perspective and experience, we get older, um, and we sort of change the way that we identify. Right? Any questions on this or any labels or concepts that you've heard? Yeah. So it's an yeah. So it's an umbrella. It's an umbrella term. Yeah, yeah. And it's a personal and it's a personal identity. So I so I sort of liken it to like um, Chicana, right? This is a politicized identity that came out of the 1960s social movements and power movements. Not everybody likes the term because it sort of puts people off because of its sort of political history, also because it was a derogatory term that was reclaimed by the community. So just like Chicana and Chicano, so was queer. It was used as, a, as an epithet um, that was reclaimed by the community. So similarly, like... Witch. Hmm? Like witch, within the witchcraft community. Yes, yes. So lots of, lots of concepts have been reclaimed by folks. So I think about like my particular community... Um, the term hoto has been reclaimed, so people talk about the hoteria, which is queer Latinx folks, like to take the power out of the word and to say, no, this is actually something that I identify with and you can't use it against me. So that's why I think some people are like, oh, no, I don't, but, it's offensive. But that could be very confusing because, like for me, mm -hmm. uh, it's like, um, like now, you know, people use African American. Uh -huh. So when I was young, it was of color, Negro, you know, so mm -hmm. then when the term is not political correct, mm -hmm. you know, then then you're concerned that you're going to offend somebody, so. Yeah, and so it's all about, like, I think, thinking about how do people want to be referred to, and so maybe just not making assumptions and just asking folks, like, what term do you prefer Another way, too, that what I do is I mirror folks. So however folks refer to themselves and whatever language they use, I'll mirror that, like if somebody refers to themselves that way. So, like, I um, was politicized in ethnic studies at Cal Poly at UC Santa Barbara, and in both places they use black and not African American. Um, so to me that sort of feels like Chicano or Hispanic. Um, and so, because I see it as a term of empowerment that came out of the 1960s, black is beautiful, black power, but because there was a shift, um, a more conservative shift in the 70s and 80s, we sort of see this term African American come up as a uh, sort of a conservative response to the power movements. It's kind of like a short explanation, but yeah, so I think it just, I think it just depends on how individuals um, identify and there are lots of options and they do change and it's a lot to keep tra to keep track of right and I was just gonna say sometimes um, it's also recommended not to ask because mm. that can bring up complications mm -hmm. um, so but we do have more training we have mm -hmm. in January we have a week-long workshop on um, issues of race ethnicity and diversity so um, please look out for that mm -hmm. um, so we can definitely get more because it is very complicated <laughs> and, and, yeah, too. and and really it's just yeah. about about practicing um i think being open um asking questions so we'll practice some some scenarios to see what that like would feel like doing that this might be too specific mm -hmm. um but when like grading papers mm -hmm. and because i do history and yep. i have students writing about other groups there's yes. one thing when it's in quotes another when they're yes. discussing it outside of quotes and sometimes figuring out mm -hmm. when to catch them on how they're referring, but then also yeah. what yeah. the jobs there of when they're referring to other groups, what terms. Yeah, so I experience that all the time. And so right up front when I'm talking to my students, 
like in the first week or two, I talk about a lot of the terms you're going to hear us use, a lot of the terms you're going to see written in the text, because we read primary source documents too, um, are going to be dated, right? You're going to see Anglo-American. People still love to use that, but I'm like, don't use that, right? It's from the 1800s. Um, people still use, or people will write Negro or colored people. And I'm like, uh, no, that's a historical term. Depending on the context, could be offensive how you're using it, right? Um, so, yeah, I think just putting it up front and talking about how, and so I show them visually, like how these concepts have changed over time and why. Um, and then when we get to that content, we talk about, okay, this is the term that was used during this historical period, but the contemporary term, the options are these. So, and it's about getting comfortable sort of moving through time and how you're referring to different groups. So, yeah, it's a little, it's a little tricky. Good questions. Okay. And so to add a layer, right? So whatever people's assigned sex at birth, they can be any one of these or, or others' identities, right? Not necessarily within the gender binary. Okay. All right. So this is going to be sort of the focus, but then we're going to add some layers and also thinking about sexuality. Um, so gender, um, and there's a couple of sub-concepts within gender. So gender identity is one's internal personal sense of their gender and how they understand um, themselves, right? Um, and then gender expression um, is the way that the person communicates their gender through dress, ornamentation, mannerism, speech, and other outward uh, expressions. Um, and gender is different across cultures. It's different across time. So, salute. So, what um, we understand, say, to be uh, a masculine characteristic in our culture today might not have even been the same in our own culture 30 years ago or across cultures, right? So, one example that I use is long hair. Um, we typically associate long hair with women, right? Um, but... I'm native, and so my dad had long hair my whole life growing up. I used to braid his hair every night after he would shower. He has piercings. My brother has their, his ears pierced and wears earrings because that's very common, right, in the native community. Now, somebody with long hair and earrings outside of that who identifies as a man, there it might not necessarily fit, right? Um, so understandings of gender are different across cultures. They're also, it's also different across time. So one example that I like using is um, basketball players. Um, so basketball players have their uniform, right? Um, and, and their shorts are pretty long, right? And they may, might wear high socks. Uh, but in the 1970s, I don't know if y'all have seen basketball games in the 1970s or maybe those of you who don't remember the 70s, the... Um, you've seen historical footage, but basketball players used to wear hot pants, like booty shorts, right? And, and they were seen as masculine in the 70s, right? And so these outward expressions of gender change over time, right? Okay, so this is a short list of some gender identities, um, trans for short or transgender, um, and then Folks will usually add on um, another gender identity, so you might see like trans woman or trans man. Um, also, gender non-conforming or non-binary. So, folks who don't feel like the gender binary um, is sufficient to understand their sense of identity or their expression. There are other terms um, for these, but those are two um, two to know folks who identify as agender. Um, so these are all sort of non-conforming identities outside of the gender um, uh, binary. Um, this one, two-spirit, I'm going to talk a little bit about, is a cultural gender identity. I mean, a lot of indigenous communities, um, there are third and sometimes fourth and fifth gender identities. Um, who folks don't fit neatly within, like, uh, the categories of man or woman, but they were a different gender, and it usually had to do with um, the, um, the, the relationship to folks, or it had to do with their occupation or the things that they were responsible for and things like that. 
Um, and then the common ones that y'all probably know, um, woman and man, right? So these are some gender identities. And folks who identify with any of these, and there's a really long list, there are way more gender identities. These are just some of the common ones. Any of these folks can have any sex sexual identity, right? Um, so you can have a trans person who identifies as gay. You can have um, a gender nonconforming person who identifies as straight, right? But maybe their gender expression is not within the binary. Um, and so I think this is where it gets tricky for people because we expect this really neat alignment, right, of man, uh, masculine, straight, but then... It could be sort of any combination of these, right? Um, any questions on this? Okay. So I have one more slide, and then we're going to do an activity. Um, and I think it's important, though, to understand that gender in our society um, is constructed as a really rigid binary, but there are gender-diverse cultures on nearly every continent for all of recorded history. Um, thriving cultures have recognized, revered, and integrated more than two genders, both historically and also today. Um, and, and there's a question, uh, one of the scenarios we're going to talk about um, is about um, an interaction between folks of the same gender that was acceptable in that person's culture, but in the U.S. it was seen as not acceptable. So how do you deal with that, right? Right. Um, so these are just a couple of examples. So with the native culture, um, they have a, a two-spirit identity or a third gender um, called Mahu. Um, in the Navajo culture, it's Nadliki. And then in the Zapotec culture of Oaxaca, they have a third gender group called uh, Mushe. Um, and this is, a, I'll put this on the resource list. This is a, a really interesting map that was put together by PBS of all of the different gender diverse cultures in the world. Well, I don't want to say all, but there's a lot <laughs> listed there. Um, I'm sure they don't have every single group. Um, but there's a lot of groups listed. Um, but because of colonization, um, because of imperialism, a lot of these identities were pushed underground. They were persecuted. So now what we see is a resurgence of folks reclaiming their ancestral ways to understand that no, actually, our societies revered and recognized more than two genders, right? And this is pretty common across, across the world, okay? Um, and this is actually a really um, famous photograph of a Navajo Nadlihi. Um, not woman, not man, um, but Nadlihi. Uh, of an anthropologist who um, worked with this person um, in the early 1900s. Lenore, I don't know if you're familiar with um, that case. Um, um, and, and really took a lot of photographs and was really fascinated with this um, person who was a third gender. Okay. All right, so let's do an activity. I think we're right at that time. So if y'all have a sheet of paper, if you need paper, I can give you a sheet of paper. Um, but I want us to think about these three questions, just kind of jot some ideas down, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, so I want you to take a moment to think about your gender. My, old, my previous mentor used to say, feel your gender. We all have a gender. What does your gender feel like? What is it doing? What, how are you expressing your gender? So I want you to think about what label do you use to describe your gender identity, and maybe even think about has that changed over time? Um, and I want you to think about what are some ways you're expressing or displaying your gender identity today. Okay? So remember, it's uh, your hair, your dress, your mannerisms, your speech, right? What are some of the ways you're expressing or displaying your gender today? How might your gender expression change on a different day? Um, and then the second question is, in what specific ways have you been socialized according to your gender? Um, what are some of the ways you break gender stereotypes? Have you given much thought to your gender before? Why or why not? I think about my gender all the time. Um, okay, so let's talk about pronouns. Um, and this is something um, that's important um, in thinking about how do we address one another. 
Um, and typically when I introduce myself and on the first day of class, I'll introduce my name, um, say, you know, I'm Professor Gonzalez, you can call me Dr. G. My pronouns are she, her, um, and then we'll go on to other things that I'm talking about. I didn't do that today because I wanted to save it for this section. Um, so I want to show you a short clip um, on gender pronouns. Okay, questions on this before we break it down a little bit? Have you all heard about pronouns? We use them. We all use them every day. Yeah? No questions before we move on? Okay. So it's important to note that legal or official and or perceived gender might not reflect a person's identity. So this is especially important for those of us um, who interact with students. So I'm thinking about like the rosters that we print um, to have students' uh, legal names um, or the way that we perceive students in class, we might want to identify them with a particular gender, but maybe they don't identify that way. Um, and so there was a segment here about misgendering and students report being misgendered by peers and teachers. I've actually had um, quite a few students here on campus um, say that they've been misgendered by um, faculty and staff either, even after telling the person what their preferred pronouns were and this usually often happens with folks who use gender neutral pronouns like they them um, or folks who don't um, present or code in a way that aligns with how they're perceived so like for example if I identified um, as a man and somebody kept using she to identify me, even though I said, can you please use he to, to identify me, right? Because you don't know. Even if I look to you to, uh, as a woman and somebody who should be using she pronouns, maybe that's not how I identify, right? Um, and so trans and gender nonconforming students whose physical presentation is not clearly gendered as stereotypically man or woman, um, and maybe who don't pursue bi biomedical transition often face hostility just in general, but um, especially on campus, this is where they spend a lot of their time. Um, and so it's really important for us to think about the language we use when interacting with students, when referring to students, so we're not misgendering them. Um, and trans and gender nonconforming students might feel highly vis visible and vulnerable, but also invisible um, because their gender identities are often unrecognizable to other people. Um, so, what, so we're going to talk about what we can what we can do about that. So, um, another point just to make is that often faculty don't. Uh, take students seriously in their request for like their affirmed name um, or what gender pronouns they want to use and a lot of times it happens after the fact so I'm going to talk about a little bit about what are some of the things I do up front in my classroom um, and maybe we can hear from some of the students if you want to share about this too some things that um, professors or faculty or staff have done that have helped create spaces for you to um, recognize and honor your your um, gender pronouns. Um, okay, so let's talk about what we can do. These are some of the facts. Okay, so this chart I'm realizing is really small and hard to see, uh, but these are some of the gender pronouns that folks use that was from the video. Um, so she, her, hers, and he, him, his are like within sort of our general realm of understanding that we hear all of the time. But there are other um, pronouns that people use. Um, one that's a little bit more common uh, for non-binary um, students that I hear them using, they, them, their. Um, so students uh, will want to be referred to as they and them. Um, and then some other ones, z, zer, um, are some other ones. I don't really hear students or faculty and staff using that one as often on campus. Um, and there are others um, as well, not just, not just um, those pronouns. Um, okay, so what questions do y'all have about pronouns? We're gonna do a little something right now. <laughs> I um, know of, a, of some situations that have come up where 
a student would prefer it like a they them there mm -hmm. uh, and when someone is then writing a letter for that person or something like that mm -hmm. communicating about them to somebody else mm -hmm. where because of the language and the structure of the language it's awkward to work in with mm -hmm. how we have traditionally mm -hmm. what, what Yeah. Yeah. So I, so the first thing that I would do in that instance is ask the student if it's okay if I use their pronoun in the writing, like their preferred pronoun. Um, but oftentimes, so what I do when I write, say, like letters of recommendation or if I'm talking about somebody else, I'll use their name. So you just would default to your name? Yeah, for the most part. And I don't think I do it um, consciously, even now that I'm thinking about it. I just tend to lean towards using the person's name. Um, so I have one student who um, uses they, them, um, but it does feel a little cumbersome, like saying it so much, especially to folks who are not used to it. So I'll intermittently like add the person's name and just refer to them by their name. Um, but and then and then it's interesting too because a lot of times what we'll f what I'll find is I'll have students using a pronoun in one class, but then if I have them another semester or maybe over the course of the semester, they'll change their pronouns. So it's about like getting used to using whatever their new pronouns are too. Mm -hmm. um, do you know if this is happening like the pronouns in other countries like in Mexico, Puerto Rico, um, or other Hawaii? Or, well, Hawaii is a but. Do you know about that? Um, so, so that's a good question, especially because Spanish is also a very gendered language. Um, and I know that there are different terms that folks are using. So like, especially in the U.S., and this is more of a, like a transnational term that's used more in the U.S., is the Latinx. So like putting the X at the end of identities that traditionally have an A or an O. So instead of Latina or Latino, they'll put the X at the end. It is more popular here in the U.S., but I know in a lot of places um, within Latin America, they're using that term um, as well. But I don't know if there's, I mean, I'm sure they're exploring questions of gender and, and things in other places, but I don't know what terminology is popular <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure that there's different um, different terminology that's very like geographic and cultural specific. For sure. I mean, there has to be right, um, especially in thinking about the previous slide about the gender diversity across the globe. Like, folks have different third and fourth gender terminology outside of English, right? So, so like in Hawaii, right? Even the Mahu identity, mm -hmm. and there's a great um, documentary. Um, I have to think of the name, but I'll put it up at the end um, about um, third gender identity in Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. Um, other questions about gender? I'm going to kind of move us forward because we're running short on time. Um, okay, so so people tend to understand that Spanish is a gendered language because the A and the O at the end of words is like for everything, right? Like. The table has a gender, the chair has a gender, right? Um, but English is also a really gendered language. It's a masculinist language. Um, so if we think about what are some of the gendered terms that we use all of the time? Uh, mankind, you guys, may the best man win, right? So phrases too. All men are created equal. Manpower. These are just the ones I was thinking of. There's like so many more. Fireman, mailman, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, and other gendered language as well, right? Boyfriend, brother, like these are all gendered um, terms. And so it's going to take some time to undo what we've all been socialized into, right? And there might be other layers because if you speak another language, thinking about how that language is gendered or not. 
Um, but English for sure is a gendered language that we tend to uh, elevate uh, masculinist language for sure. Uh, but what are some of the ways we can start to think about decentralizing masculin masculinist language? So one in particular is you guys. People say this all the time, right? It's a very common you guys. Um, and I was speaking to somebody uh, uh, about this. What are some other alternatives? So a common one that's often used is y'all, right? Um, very southern um, and I actually was able to pick it up really quickly because my roommate was from Texas. Um, so it just sort of, she re-socialized me really, really easily. Um, but there are some others when you're addressing a group of people. So where did I, I just yesterday on campus, somebody, we were at an event and people were like, ladies and gentlemen. And I was like, well, there's probably other genders in the room other than just ladies and gentlemen. Um, but it, it still happens, right, all the time. So thinking about, okay, if you're addressing a group of people, what are some options that are not gendered to address the group? What do you think? Uh -huh. uh, I've heard ladies and gentlemen. Oh, say that again. <laughs> it's like ladies and gentlemen. Jadies and gentlemen. Okay, I like that. That's going to get some tongue twister. tongue twister, yeah, some practice getting used to it. What else? Uh, how about hello, everyone? Everyone? Yeah, and there's language that we already have that we can use to easily just switch. Yeah, everyone. What else? Uh huh. What was that? Folks. Folks. Uh huh. Yeah. This might be like a generational thing, but mm. the younger generation has noticed. Dude is being used like for both guys and girls. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I use it that way yeah. too. But also because the '90s, we used to call everybody dude. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh huh. What else? It does. It does. But it's one of those words, I think, that's in transition. So maybe that's a, more of an in-group kind of thing, like within your group, if everyone's consenting to be referred to as dude. <laughs> what else? What about individuals? Yeah, so you can, you can refer to folks by their names or hello, individuals. Yeah. What else? Any others? Hello, guys. Well, so guys is the gendered. Um, and I'll say this too, like if it's a close group of friends or like my literal family, hi family, hello family, um, familia sometimes I'll use, um, I say, and sometimes I was telling somebody I use cultured terms or, um, so I'll say gente, what's up gente, like people, people, right? Um, so there's lots of different options, it's just about like practicing, um, and using them, right? Okay. So now, turn to your neighbor. <laughs> Think about introducing yourself with your pronouns. So I will model, for example, hello, my name is Amber, and my pronouns are she, her. People use she, her, hers, and I don't think you need that third one. It's kind of implied, um, the possessive, right? Um, so do you want to try it? How did that feel? Thoughts on that? It seem pretty... It's doable, right? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, yeah, so it's just taking practice, right, to think about what are the ways that we use uh, masculinist language um, or language that really upholds the gender binary. How do we start undoing that? It's just practice. It's just practice. So we've been socialized. So I think about when I started re-socializing myself uh, because of ethnic studies. I was maybe 21. So, you know, I've had 20 years of being socialized in the gender binary um, and then like really like practicing to like re-socialize myself, especially with language. Language is such a, um, an important part of who we are, how we communicate, how we I, connect or identify with one another. So it's just about um, practice. And I really liked in the video when they were saying, if you slip up, just, you know, apologize and move on. Correct yourself and move on. Because if you sort of make a really big deal, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to use... She, when you use they, and how, how can I make it? And I'm just, I mean, you know, I'm sorry. You move on, right? Don't make it a big deal. Um, and I've, I've um, also um, just sort of observed people, too, and I'll see students say, oh, okay, you guys, uh, I mean y'all, or okay, you guys, uh, I mean everyone, right? And you just correct yourself and move on. It's just practicing. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, I have a question. Uh -huh. If somebody identifies 
as lesbian, then what would be the pronoun? This person usually would want. Do you think it's more like he or? Whatever they prefer. Uh, but and that's the way that. I know, and it might not, and it's gonna take it's gonna take practice, right? And I think that's because gender and sexuality are different identities, and so so maybe if a person is a lesbian, it depends on how they express themselves and understand their gender in relationship to their sexuality. So they might they might want to use they them, they might want to use she her. It's just about. Because I was thinking, and, and again, this has been I don't know how long this is going on, but it's kind of mm-hmm. new. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I was thinking they and them would be somebody that doesn't identify with one or the other. Mm-hmm. Usually, yeah. Uh-huh. But People have different reasons why they don't, but that's definitely one reason because they feel like that the other pronouns are not quite fitting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, and sometimes people um, change their their pronouns or their gender identity changes over time because they're kind of figuring it out. Um, and so you might know somebody, uh, a staff member or a student, who one day uses she, but then, you know, down the line might want to have you use a different pronoun for them because they've sort of come into understanding their gender identity differently. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so just, I think, being open, welcoming feedback um, from folks, and just be ready to make adjustments. And just once you're cognizant of it, it's easier to sort of practice using um the correct pronouns. Um, Yeah, so just, uh, we talked about this. Um, So when addressing groups of people or people whose pronouns that you haven't been told, um, I usually just default to gender neutral language um, if I'm not sure how people um, identify until we can figure it out. Okay, so this is perfect. We'll spend like the last 20 minutes talking about the scenarios that you all proposed. Um, let's see, two, three, four, five, six. So I have six different scenarios. One, two, three, four. We have enough to to cover these. Um, so what I'm going to do um, is hand you all one scenario. I want you to talk about it, think about what the issues are, what comes up, and then what are some ways to address the scenario, and then hopefully we'll have enough time to discuss these and then do like a share out. Um, for some best practices, maybe pose some possible solutions. Um, But a lot of these are going to be just kind of addressing as we go and learning as we go. But I think these are all really good ones. Share their scenario and if you came up with like what you think is a good approach or maybe even if you have like you still have questions about it. Mm-hmm. With safe spaces often we'll uh, say things like aren't you uh, segregating yourself or if we don't do it <laughs> for one group we will have to do it for all groups mm. or shouldn't we um, then have safe spaces for white men and heterosexuals mm-hmm, yeah. and then so like our yeah. resolution was that um, that has to do with privilege like the tone of that would be um, mm. tied with privilege because you really don't understand what it's like to actually look for safe space yeah. right um, to for me like one of the things that we talked about in our group is understanding diversity because human beings are just generally complex right there are people who are you could be a straight person with like say autism but there are like people who are in the LBGTQ plus community who have autism. There are people who are in the uh, say different groups, different ages and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that to understand diversity, you really do have to create these different um, understanding outlets. Because mm-hmm. I feel like mm-hmm. just generally with the LBGTQ plus community, like Asian Americans, Latin, Latino Americans, 
um, most people tend to put all these different groups into one category, mm. thinking that everybody's the same. Mm -hmm. And then like, oh, if you are from a said group, that applies to everybody. But one of the things I also emphasize in my ethnic studies class with Dr. G was that in every, every one of these groups, there's always a subgroup within that group. Mm -hmm. So there are people who are like, yeah. say, I don't know, uh, Mexican Americans, Vietnamese Americans, Korean Americans, or whatever group, right? There are those who are gay and ha are, you know, uh, have autism. There are those who are, like, I guess, not gay, right? And, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it's just, it's very complex. Mm -hmm. Things are mm -hmm. very complex. Mm -hmm. so you can't just put one yeah. person in one category yeah. because even if someone is, like, a straight person can have the same experience with a gay person, say, if you're, like, white, versus if you're a gay person of color, because now you have to experience racism and homophobia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, that was that. Good, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I, I, and I get that a lot. Well, if we're making space for this group, we have to make it you know, for all these other groups. And I would say, yeah, and we can be conscientious of thinking about, and I really appreciate that response. Well, why do we even need to create these spaces anyways? Because society is very hostile to particular groups. So why don't we create a space for straight white men? Because we call that society. Um, all the institutions are built to uphold those identities, right? Um, and so even thinking about, yeah, so the, the question about wanting to create um, safer spaces, it's really thinking about the why. Like, why are these even needed anyways? Because of the hostility, the violence, the discrimination um, that exists. So sort of adding that layer of, of questioning why, um, because we want those students to feel safe and respected and honored um, as much as we can, right, in all of their complexities. Um, and it takes a lot of practice, and there's probably groups um, that are, like, might not feel represented, um, but, but it takes practice in thinking about all of these intersections. And I know, like, one of my blind spots um, are students with disabilities, and that's something that I've been really reading about and thinking about how can I make my classroom more accessible for students who have a variety of disabilities um, that then, you know, they're going to feel safe and, and able to learn as, you know, in, in a way that sort of honors, honors them. Um, but yeah, just kind of thinking about all of those complexities. Good. Maybe like one more scenario. Does anybody want to share? Mm -hmm. um, I was talking about how um, the, this person's experience at, um, at the LGBT club, how they were talking about if they, um, they use someone um, or they themselves attempted or thought about suicide. Mm. And um, we were talking about like, how growing up, because most of the time LGBTQ identity comes in the teenager. Mm -hmm. And then um, a lot of these, in my experience, because with the younger gen generations, there I see more and more people coming out mm -hmm. as LGBTQ. And it's, um, it, the teenage years are already a hard time just trying to find mm -hmm. who you are. Yeah. So having the extra added weight of like being discriminated against while mm -hmm. being part of the LGBTQ community. That's, mm -hmm. that's a lot to think about. Yeah, like, yeah. I just think that we just need to be more open, which is who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I definitely think, um, you know, sort of out of my purview teaching college level, but I think there's a lot of work to be done at our level, but also in the K through 12, for sure, um, in terms of trying to create spaces um, sort of in the beginning, thinking about how do we reduce harm as much as possible. Um, and part of that is um, not just being bystanders and like intervening when things are happening, um, calling things for what they are. I think bullying is um, sort of a euphemism for violence. Um, and so thinking about sex education and being really inclusive in <laughs> including LGBTQ experiences. Because I think about the sex education I got in fourth grade, then in middle school, and then I think again in health class in high school. None of those were inclusive at all, right? Um, and so just kind of normalizing um, language and these diverse identities at a younger age so folks have the language 
um, and have the capacity to be able to like engage with with different communities, right? Yeah, and it's our responsibility um, to do that, all of us. Yeah. Okay. Did you want to share yours too, Kristen? Yeah. So our sound is like a very kind of simple question. Mm. Woo. <laughs> a couple of things we were talking about is um, whether somebody's open to listening mm-hmm. and how you deal with the fact that if you've got somebody that is real clear. And you could replace that with coworkers, with, right? Right. And, mm-hmm. and then the responsibility and the emotional work that goes with being the person who always feels the responsibility mm-hmm. to educate someone on an issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I no, there was like a, there was a story it's not going over someone in a what would be identified as a fairly privileged group set up a table with a poster that was come tell me why I'm such and such or come educate me on this oh I saw that yeah like the perfect mm-hmm. visual of sitting there with that privilege and expecting other people to come educate mm-hmm. me instead of that person going out to see mm-hmm. information mm-hmm. So we, I, I, did, we come, we didn't, did we come up with a solution or a pro- I mean, these aren't really like solvable things. Right. It's more like approaches, like what would you do kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so anything like tangible that you said, like some things that you could do? I think it depends on the level of homophobia. Yeah. Then. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard because I feel like I recently came out and I was like faced, but, like I went to like a, a little party with my cousins and they were being, they were saying really, um, just hurtful things, mm. just kind of like mm-hmm. talking about, you know, I guess my sexuality as just sex. So mm-hmm. it would be like, how do you do this? Right. Or whatever, right? Right. And they even went to the extent of like, um, it's it's like emotional, you mm-hmm. know? Just, ugh. So yeah, like, grab like one of their like gay friends, right? Mm. And they were like, oh, would you? You know, to, towards me, mm-hmm. and it's just like, what? Like, how is that okay? Yeah. Like, how is that like? And I really wasn't this distraught about it in the moment. Mm-hmm. I think I was like super shook by it. Yeah. And then, like, I, right now I'm feeling it. You know. Yeah. And it is tough, and it's just like, like, how do I tell them? Because I don't even know what I like. I'm feeling. You know? Yeah. Like, how, how do I? Yeah. Educate them when I'm like. You know, just like I'm wondering, like what what's what's going on, and like mm-hmm. how do I mm-hmm. still like be myself? Because they're very like like easygoing, like party people, and like they're really sweet, but like they can like this mm-hmm. is harsh, you know? Yeah. And um, if I said like, oh, like you're being harsh, or like this, you're an asshole, <laughs> like yeah. It just it's like oh, you're being too sensitive, or you're just like you're not. You don't understand or humor. I don't know. It's just, mm-hmm. it's a lot. And I really, I didn't even cry when this happened. Like, I feel like I'm just talking about mm-hmm. it and I'm feeling what happened. Mm-hmm. And so, I don't know. Like, in, in yeah. my head, I want to just really, like, just reject them and be like, I don't have the energy for this. Yeah. Like, I don't, I can't educate you. Yeah. I don't even know what to say. Like, <clears throat> Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. I really, I really appreciate it. And a lot of things came up for me with that is like how we hold things and we put them somewhere, Mm -hmm. right? And then they come up later. So if we think about like how we're engaging with each other, just to kind of like be cognizant of all of those things that people carry with them. So like, thank you for processing that. Um, And I think there's a couple of folks who can maybe comment on addressing your concerns. Yeah. I think like I was the one that wrote that about the gay club and the suicidal tendencies and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Like from my own experience as a gay person, it's like, again, going back to what I said, where if you're, if homophobia and racism are two different things. So being like the only gay person in my family and then someone used like the word fag or something homophobic, it hurts only me and not everybody else. But then you learn to like have a tougher skin where I don't have to be aggressive. I don't even have to go down that level where you know, I have to prove myself twice as hard than, than everybody else to show that I am an educated person and that I could act better than that. And that mm. if, like, like my dad and my brother are both kind of like those masculine type of guys that you mm. have to like have a dirt bike, you have to work out, you have to have mm. a gun and, and stuff like that. But for me, it's like, yeah, I'm a gay person, I'm loud and I'm out there because I'm gay and I wear, you know, nail polish and have Hello Kitty and whatnot. But that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm under anyone or that my worth as a human being is less than anyone else. Which I use that 
like experience to toughen my own skin, but also prepare my nieces who are girls that, you know, this world's gonna be full of people with crap and you don't need to go down that level with those people. Prove mm. them otherwise and be educated. Mm. So I'm sorry, it's just like my own experience as well as like like with that um, LBGTQ plus community, we had one here before um, in Lambda. There was like, what, 10 people who are identified as LBGTQ plus, uh, lesbians, gays, trans, and all of us experienced attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. All of us thought about it, all of us attempted it. Some of us knew people who had <laughs> committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And because we're in this community. But the thing is, that's how you toughen yourself up. It's like going into battle and then you have that armor, mm -hmm. that extra boost to defend yourself and work twice as hard. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think that's so important. One of the things is to find community and folks who can like hold space for you to like process that stuff. And yeah, um, that's what's like super frustrating for me because like yeah. I don't know anything. Well, <laughs> <laughs> come see me. Um, but yeah, and and so we're trying to revive the QPOC club on campus. It just gets really hard because of all the stuff that the students carry like emotionally and work and um you know but there are su there's support um on, on campus for sure um, but i want to uh, let yeah, yeah janelle um, well, so i was going to say mm -hmm. in terms of like confronting or talking to those homophobic people mm -hmm. like self-care is always first mm -hmm. yeah and it's that like you get to sit in your privilege and let other people come educate you well sometimes we need to actually like care for ourselves and not educate mm -hmm. right. not be the educator yeah. not right. be the fixer yeah. um so i know for me like i grew up in a super conservative like southern baptist family mm -hmm. um so it's mm -hmm. been challenging and um like my whole community and rejected me my family is still figuring things out um but i've like i've had seasons mm -hmm. so like before I came out to my family, I built up a community because I mm. knew this is not going to go well. Mm. And so, like, I need a chosen family that's going to mm -hmm. hold me up and be there when I step in to have important conversations and when that doesn't go well mm -hmm. so that I can fall back on mm -hmm. that. Um, but then, I again, I've gone through seasons. And so when I'm feeling strong and I'm feeling like my armor is up and mm -hmm. I'm good to go, and I can approach them with love and grace and compassion, and not like I need to fix and change them. Mm -hmm. um, I step in and I do go to battle in very loving. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's definitely been moments yeah. where I'm like, I'm done with y'all right now, because yeah. like this is harmful to me, mm -hmm. and I and I don't do it out of vengeance or anger, yeah. but I do it out of self care and mm -hmm. self respect, and right. I step back. Mm -hmm. and I love me yes. and as I build that back up I step back in mm -hmm. and so the good news for me at least is I haven't had to step out for a really long time mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. um, because I've grown in that strength and that endurance and all these other things but also my family has made progress right. yeah. um, and they're nowhere near where I want them to be mm -hmm. right. um, and some of my friends I just let go yeah um, but yeah. like I've grown and developed in that um, in terms of building community um, and that was a super struggle for me because I'm gay and Christian, which is not a combination. Mm -hmm. um, but there's actually a lot of those, and there's organizations in the U.S. for gay Christians. Um, but then there's also the centers, and I know the OC Center and the Long Beach Center mm -hmm. have all kinds of support groups and other mm -hmm. things that go on there. So that's something to look in there mm -hmm. into. There are Facebook groups. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of became my first community mm -hmm. um, when I was like, oh, shit, I'm gay. Um, which took way longer than it should have, but um, was building community in those spaces so mm -hmm. that there was always somebody to talk to and mm -hmm. to process things with. Mm -hmm. um, so don't give up on seeking out that community because yeah. it is there, but it takes yeah. a second to find it. Yeah. Um, but it is there. I like, I like you said about self care because I feel like being a good person is the number one thing because once you know your own worth, you don't have to prove your worth to anyone else, whether they like it or not. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to say, like, that's been some of the power in me not needing to change my family. Right. Yeah. Like, I really, truly am to the point where I'm like, I'm awesome. Right. <laughs> this is your loss. Yeah. And not just yeah. for them. This is for the church that kicked me right. out and yeah. anybody else. And, like, the people that have me in their life benefit from that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, like, you're missing out by not having that. So, like, I'm really in this conversation for your sake, not for mine. Mm -hmm. right. And that changes right. because yeah. I don't need to change their minds right. right. Yeah. 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 Right? Like, it's not about me needing them to accept me. I'm good. I got other right. family. Right. right? But just trust me, y'all will be better off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Thank you so much. That was, uh, I think, a great sort of wrap up. I just want to give um, just a couple of like takeaways um, and then some resources. So I'm just going to go over these quickly, like some of the things we learned, some of the tangibles we can do. And y'all can take a picture of the slide once I get to the last bullet if you want. Um, so it, practice introducing yourself with your pronouns. You'll get more comfortable doing it. Um, and there were questions about, well, how do I find out other people's pronouns? Well, if you introduce yourself with theirs, with yours, you might encourage folks to start doing it too, back to you. Um, don't make assumptions about gender and sexuality. So depending on the context, it might be okay to ask, but as Lenore said, it might not be okay to just upfront ask. You kind of use your judgment. Uh, one thing I do is mirror. So if I hear a person, how they refer to themselves, I'll, I'll mirror that. Um, and then just respect, right? Be sort of humble um, in the process. Um, one thing that some folks recommend, having something LGBTQ plus related in your office or on your person, so like a pin, a button, just to kind of like identify yourself as an ally. So I have like a safe zone um, poster um, on my door. Sometimes just having something visual um, is good uh, for folks. Um, and I'll switch it up. So sometimes I'll have, I have a button that says like uh, brown folks, um, for black, trans, and LGBTQ rights, or I'll have one that's like my Lambda button, or I'll have like uh, my Malcolm X button, just depending on how I feel that day, right? So I wear all kinds of different ones. Um, support, normalize, and validate, st validate students' feelings around their gender and sexuality. You might not have all the right answers, or your peers, right? Your friends, if you're a student, or your own. You might not have all the right answers, but I think deep listening, asking questions, um, just engaging in respectful conversation is really what students um, and your peers want. It's not about having all the answers, right? Just support. Um, also, something we didn't really talk about, but that I want to say is not to advise students to come out and don't out them, whether it's their gender, whether it's their sexuality, whatever it is. Um, there is a dominant discourse um, in the mainstream LGBTQ com movement around coming out and like the importance of coming out. Um, and while that's important for some, it's not an option for all because for some folks it could mean getting kicked out of your house, it could mean violence, it could mean all sorts of things. Um, but then honoring if, if students or folks around you come out to you um, um, to just know that somebody trusts you with, with that. Um, and then maintaining confidentiality, right, obviously, if, if they do. Um, and this is with students, or if you are a student, obviously, with your peers. Um, and just challenging homophobia, transphobia, heteronormativity, heterosexism, so a bunch of other terms we didn't cover, but you can kind of get the gist, right, of what this means. Um, and this is really just being an active bystander and, like, intervening when possible, when safe. Because um, a lot of folks kind of let real homophobic stuff slip out of their mouth in casual conversation. Um, so instead of just being shook by it and walking away, like practice, like intervene, like, hey, why would you say that? Or, you know, that wasn't okay, right? Um, I always like challenging with questions, um, like, where did that come from? And people are like, boo, I don't know, actually, where that came from, right? Um, one thing I think super important, including LGBTQ plus content in your curriculum, if you're an educator, if you have questions about that, I have lots of tips on that were and I want to say um, the ethnic studies department is offering an intro to LGBTQ studies class for the first time in the history of the college this fall I'm super excited about it um, so we'll be posting like promo stuff um, and Professor Smith is teaching it I'll check with her about how she feels but I always invite faculty to come to my classes I'm like if there's something like a topic we're talking about or lecturing on you're always more than welcome to come to any of my classes and just sit and observe. So I'll talk to her. Maybe she is open to that too. But I teach the intro to women's studies class and we talk, it's a, it's a gender studies class. So we talk about that a lot as well. Um, using gender and sexuality inclusive language, both verbally and in writing. So thinking about your syllabus, maybe putting your pronouns in your email, um, how, how you refer to folks and just practice, right? Just practicing. Um, learn about and refer to campus and community organizations. I'm going to give you a couple right now, so that way you can refer your peers or students to. It's really important. Um, and then just one question I want to pose, what are some other things we can do to be advocates and allies for LGBTQ folks, students and faculty? So that's the last one if you want to take a picture 
of it. Anything else that y'all can think of? I mean, these are pretty broad, so I think it covers a lot. Yeah? I think for me, um, mm -hmm. I talk about my wife in class. Mm -hmm. And I teach ESL, so then my students just look at me like, am I using the right word? <laughs> <laughs> but it, I've had uh -huh. multiple students approach me and say, thank you so much. Mm. The teachers just don't share this part of themselves, yeah. and we yep. don't get to see a lot of role models. Mm -hmm. And I yes. think for students, when we start to normalize, that language, mm -hmm. um, and I very intentionally use wife because mm -hmm. it like throws a kink in heteronormativity, uh -huh. right? Um, but when we start to use that language like it's no big deal, I mm -hmm. think that's what makes mm -hmm. it less of a big deal, mm -hmm. um, and we become more visible, and mm -hmm. people have other people to look to to go, okay, it's not just me, mm -hmm. or there's somebody I can talk to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Amber. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.